welcome to everybody um, to the Sonoma County Regional Library and UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County. Uh, the presentation today will, trans will be Transforming to a Sustainable Garden, uh, presented by Kim Pearson. And I want to say uh, again, welcome to everybody uh, on this beautiful Saturday morning, and uh, we'll, we're glad to have you here with us. My name is uh, Bruce Horace Robinson, um, and I'm going to be the Master Gardener Moderator today for today's presentation. Um, I'm a Master Gardener, and I graduated uh, with the class of 2016. Um, the, um, uh, I wanted to take a moment to explain the collaboration uh, with the Sonoma County Library that we have had for many years. As many of you know, um, each branch in the Sonoma County Library system had uh, workshops um, throughout the year um, or throughout the gardening uh, season. And, um, and now we're transit during the current conditions, um, we are transitioning to a more digital uh, format. And we will be, and we're grateful that the uh, Sonoma County Library is still collaborating with us and working with us so that we can continue to perform our mission uh, of bringing um, garden information to um, home gardeners that is sustainable and science-based. Um, there are going to be um, uh, some ground rules for our presentation uh, today, and they are as follows. Um, the um, uh, first thing is that we're going to be asking that everyone mute uh, their um, during mute their sound during the presentation, and we're going to be asking that everyone uh, uh, turn off their video so that uh, it will not be taking up a lot of bandwidth, and the focus will be uh, on the presenter Kim Pearson for her presentation. So again, to repeat, we're asking that everybody turn off their sound and um, and and or mute their audio and uh, turn off their uh, video. Uh, the next uh, ground rule is that we will be um, uh, allowing questions to be asked of the presenter in the chat room. And if you're new to Zoom, um, uh, there are many different locations or possible locations based upon the um, device that you're using for chat. Sometimes it will appear as the word chat at the bottom of the screen or at the top of the screen. Um, on all you have to do is click on that. Um, you might be able to find the chat button uh, in the uh, link for participants. Sometimes it's located there. And in other, uh, other times, and particularly on iPads, which I have, um, the chat um, setting or chat, uh, the location of chat is under the three buttons uh, where it says um, more, M-O-R-E. So that is the location where you will be allowed to ask any questions um, of the presenter at the end of her presentation. And um, we will be uh, placing in to the uh, chat um, room, as I'm calling it, um, special links and other information related to the uh, presentation. So please be sure to check that out also. Finally, um, uh, the presentation will be recorded, and um, and what will happen is is that when the recording starts, if you have not already seen it, um, a, a drop down box or a dialog box will appear on your screen that gives you the option of continuing with the presentation and the recording, or allows you to leave the presentation if you do not wish to be. Um, uh, recorded at this particular time. So now I'm going to turn my attention to um, introducing uh, Kim Peterson, our Master Gardener speaker, who is going to be uh, presenting her presentation on transforming to a sustainable garden. Uh, Kim has a Bachelor of Science in Ornamental Horticulture from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and she has worked in the landscape industry as a gardener designer um, for more than 20 years and has been a Sonoma County Master Gardener since 2011. The Master Gardener projects where she gives volunteer hours and, uh, or where she earns volunteer hours include prop 
Propagation for Education, uh, where she um, participates in growing hundreds of plants to benefit fundraising for the nonprofit Master Gardeners Program. She serves as a garden sense consultant and designing the Master Gardener Sustainable uh, Demo Garden at the Sonoma County Fair um, for the past five years. Kim's favorite activities include crafting, using recyclable materials, and growing succulents. So uh, Kim, I'm prepared to turn it over to you and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Bruce. And thank you to my support team. This is a kind of a new experience dealing with Zoom. So um, let me take you to, um, did we cover this part, uh, Bruce? Um, uh, yes, I, I did mention those, but again, I'm glad that you uh, showed the slide again. Again, and we'll restate those. It says, please leave your audio and video off, ask questions using the chat box, and this Zoom talk is being recorded. Thank you, Kim. All right, thank you, Bruce. So um, this is a cover slide again, but I wanted to show you this picture in particular because um, this garden um, presentation is, um, it actually is like an overview of all that master gardeners uh, do in our outreach to the public. We are all about sustainable um, transformations and sustainable ideas. And we are um, a large group of people with lots of different projects. Um, this particular slide I love because it's a, it's a really great example of what a sustainable garden can be. This is not my garden. This is a garden of Josh Williams. Um, he's no longer lives at this house, but he designed and probably grew all of these plants from seedlings or young plants. He's the owner of uh, Cal Flora Nursery, but we got to tour his garden. And this is just a really magnificent use of all California natives. So uh, California natives can be beautiful as well. In, um, in a landscape setting, not just individually. So what is sustainable gardening? It's basically a series of concepts um, and, and, and um, practices where you select plants, including edible plants, that are adapted to their climate and microclimate. And you, in using these practices, you are conserving water, protecting water quality, nurturing soil, recycling organic matter, incorporating pest management, which we can talk about more later, and protecting and encouraging desirable wild, wildlife, conserving and conserving energy. So this is our uh, wheel of sustainability. These are the main uh, topics that I'll be talking about in a general form. And, for each one of these uh, concepts and um, practices, we have almost a project for every one of these. We have projects that involve um, groups of people at, from Master Gardeners that involve food growing, um, composting, uh, beneficial IPM, uh, irrigation, um, and conserving water. So we have covered these subjects with individual projects uh, throughout um, our program. And this is our, our main focus um, uh, for the general conversation for the day today. Okay, so why should we care about sustainability? I love this picture because it's, it is Sonoma County and this is what we love about Sonoma County is the old trees that have been here for years and many, many hundreds of years. And we want to keep um, things um, healthy and viable in the, for the future. Land and, <clears throat> land and water are very limited resources. Our population has increased by 72% in the wildlife um, interface, urban er interface since uh, 1968. And our wildfires, as everyone knows, has just exploded um, during that time. Uh, major population increases have a higher demand for water and our existing systems um, 
can be stretched in the future if we do not conserve. And that includes well water as well. So uh, climate change is very real and reoccurring dr uh, droughts can no longer be ignored. Sonoma County is a summer dry climate and our gardens should really reflect the conditions we have here. Native plants and wildlife diversity are being threatened by habitat loss from urban development and agricultural expansion. So what does a summer dry climate look like? Uh, California has a unique summer dry climate that is really specific to only a few air other areas in the world. That includes the Mediterranean basin, the central Chile area, of South America, so, um, Southern and Western uh, Cape of South Africa, um, the Southern and Western portions of Australia and New Zealand. Um, these areas are uniquely dry during the summer, unlike the areas on the East Coast of the United States, or perhaps even England, where a lot of people envision their gardens to be. They, um, these areas, and the east coast of the United States actually have wet summers or consistently wet conditions throughout the year. We do not. So we should select plants based on our, our weather conditions here. And um, we can talk more about plants in a few slides from now, but um, this is what we mean by summer dry climate. We are dry pretty much from spring to fall. So um, this is my front garden um, as a before, an example of before and after. Um, I live in a suburban neighborhood in Santa Rosa and most of the neighborhood was lawn from the house all the way out to the street. Um, my children are grown now, so I no longer need a lawn for them to play on. And it was just a visual um, piece of ground um, that basically was unused. So a 1,000 square foot lawn can use up to 22,000 gallons of water per year versus 7,500 gallons of water for a water-wise garden. Mowers and blowers used in gardens like this can contribute up to 5% of the air pollution total in, in California. One hour of mowing can equal 350 miles of driving. Fertilizers and herbicides, herbicides that are used to control lawn weeds for a perfect looking English lawn, um, when it rains or when even it's irrigated, over irrigated, I would say, it, the, these chemicals can leach from the lawn into the streets and the streets will take it to our river and drinking um, water systems, so, and eventually to the ocean. So we want to minimize the leaching of chemicals into our water systems. Most lawns are simply decorative. Most lawns do not provide food or habitat for wildlife or pollinators. They're considered a green desert and they don't improve any water, any soil quality. So we'll talk more about that um, as well. So this is my garden after. Um, I, I find it to be a lot more interesting, attractive. I just love to drive up to it and see it change throughout the year. Um, and it also just it generally is prettier and uh, gives me more interest. So what the, what's the difference here now? We have a dry stream that collects my roof water on one side of my house and drainage from the backyard and it recharges the groundwater. Um, the lawn was replaced with a much smaller little meadow of grass. Shrubs are watered by subsurface inline drip irrigation. The California natives and climate appropriate plants that I've used have year round interest and native flowers provide food sources for pollinators. All leaf litter is collected from the nearby trees and used as mulch. I often will shred it into smaller pieces to use it as mulch. Composting leaves will help feed soil microbes. And when you, um, 
are feeding the soil microbes, you're also feeding the plants. So compost is a fantastic way of fertilizing. The new design is more interesting, I think, and definitely requires less maintenance because I don't have to mow every week. And I, it was definitely a struggle to get my teenager to mow when I was younger. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink. Okay, so next slide. All right, sustainable. It's really beautiful. This is the other side of my garden. It's actually a younger picture of the garden. It's more um, developed and more mature now. And here is my garden. The second picture is, is my garden during the fall. You can see my, my meadow and my dry stream as well. And some paving that is permeable paving. So another side of the garden. So how did I get there? So the first step was sheet mulching. You can see how bad my lawn had gotten from neglect. So I was no longer fertilizing it. The moles have moved in and it was in general just this uh, repair, I guess you could call it. So the first step is to um, block off the uh, sprinkler heads that I no longer needed. And I took one of those sprinkler heads and I converted it with a conversion kit of drip. And basically you take one sprinkler head, you screw in this system, which you can find at uh, local um, professional irrigation stores. And it becomes not just a, um, a drip um, tea, but also has a pressure reducer and a filter that is necessary for the drip. The, all the other sprinkler heads were capped off. So that valve that used to water the lawn is now a drip system. The other part of um, the prep for sheet mulching is you can dig a channel. I can show you with my handy dandy laser pointer. Um, this, this is a channel that you build. Um, you cut out like a U-shaped channel any place you meet a hard surface like a concrete sidewalk. And so when you lay down the cardboard, which is one of the steps, and you add the mulch on top, you're not going above the level of the, uh, the, of the sidewalk and you are gonna have um, a, tr a smooth transition between the sheet mulching and the sidewalk. Excuse me, I'm gonna drink a little bit more. All right, so next slide. Okay, so another example of the steps, and we have all the steps for sheet, sheet, sheet mulching, mulching. <laughs> my, my, my voice is getting weird. Sheet mulching, we have all the steps on our web page, but here's some more of some pictures. They are, in this case, they're using, instead of cardboard, they're using paper. This is rolled paper. Um, and this is my lawn after I sheet mulched, sheet mulched, um, the big truck delivered, um, I used arbor mulch. Um, one good way to do it is um, underneath the cardboard or paper is to put actual compost and then the cardboard overlapping the pieces so that you have no air coming or no light showing through. And then the sheet mulching uh, material on top is uh, composted arbor mulch and I used four to six inches. Um, and then of course, watering the whole process is very important because that starts the soil organisms um, coming up from different places and they start to do their magic of eating away that old grass and creating a nicer surface to plant in. I, I chose to leave my uh, sheet mulching for, I did it in the fall and I chose to leave it over the winter and then I planted in the spring. But actually fall is a really good time to plant and you can potentially do the sheet mulching right now, um, water it in and with a composted mulch, like an arbor mulch, you can plant directly in that. If you have larger plants, you just go and dig a hole below the cardboard or the paper, you know, and add a little bit more um, 
compost in that hole, and then you can go ahead and plant. Um, on most situations, it's really good to use smaller plants unless you're using some trees. All right, the next my thing. Okay, so it's also time, another concept, another practice of sustainability is to think about how you're using your water. 63% um, of all the water used in Sonoma County is for residential, which is something to really think about. You know, somebody, sometimes you think, oh, it's agriculture that's taking all of our water. Well, we're actually using quite a bit of the water in our homes. And 70% of the single family residential water use is outdoors. So potentially that's a lot of water that is directly given to our garden and not necessarily sustainably used. In a, in a suburban area, 70% of all rain that falls to the ground is drained directly into the streets and sewer. And that is all of the rain that hits the rooftops, the streets, patios, and it all just runs right into your gutter. What happens is that actually adds to the water that is happening um, in our streams during a rain event. And so sometimes that actually adds to the flooding that can occur around here sometimes. Not to mention you're also washing any chemicals, oils from the street, any of those uh, nasty things that are on the ground or the roofs that all goes into our water supply, which I think I got ahead of myself. So, so it does matter because of those pesticides and fertilizers leaching into our water system. Those pollutants will harm our habitat. Also, over well, overuse of well water and drilling deeper and deeper for water, it will deplete our aquifers. And it takes many, many years for those aquifers to replenish themselves. Some of them are ancient and took many years, hundreds of years in fact, to create um, a sustainable amount of water and we're using it at a very quick rate in some areas of the county. So protecting our water quality. The way that I am demonstrating today is, um, is with a rain garden. Um, soil and plants are actually extremely efficient at purifying water. So a rain garden basically is a low spot in your garden that is usually amended with um, organic material, bark or compost or other materials that will absorb the water um, as it enters this low spot. It um, will slowly drain through the soil and help to replenish the aquifer. So rather than having the downspout go directly out to the street, which is what I've learned when I was learning you know, uh, landscape design back a few years ago, the concept was always take it out to the street. Well, now we're realizing that that's actually not the best thing for residents. You wanna take it at least 10 feet away from your house. You don't ever want to dump it next to your house. But um, a rain garden uh, located in your garden actually will help to clean your water off the roof, sidewalks, you know, etc. and um, help to purify that water. So it's a really great option. And there will be some, um, I believe there's some articles in our web page that talk more about rain gardens and other speakers in our library series have special talks about rain gardens. They're really very nice and they're very beautiful to look at as well. You can tell here that a rain garden can be really pretty. Um, this particular garden here is another master gardener who lives in Petaluma and she made a gorgeous uh, front entrance with a dry stream that comes down into her garden and that takes the roof water and um, distributes, it, distributes it throughout the front yard. This garden here is located at SBI in Windsor, I believe. They have a demonstration garden for a rain garden and low water plants, something you can go out and take a look at. This garden here, I believe is in Portland or Seattle. And this is a city, um, 
that is very actively trying to be sustainable. So they take cutouts in the curb and they take all the water that comes off the street and it places it in this um, hell strip is what we call them in landscape design. Basically you turn it into a beautiful garden that actually filters the water. Um, and so that actually is one way to reduce flooding. Oh, so this is my um, garden again. I took the downspout with a solid line, directed it out to a uh, ditch basically out and I placed it center going perpendicular to my house across about the middle of my property. And I have from my garage out to the street, maybe 20 feet. So I located it at least 10 feet away from my garden, on my, I'm sorry, from my house. So it's not near any structures. I chose to use a rock um, base but if you have any nearby trees, I recommend not using anything but larger boulders because leaves will collect in there and that becomes another maintenance issue. And all the leaves falling in a uh, rain garden, that, um, that can look really beautiful. It also can add to the ability to absorb water. So I have to clean my leaves out so I can see the rocks. It's better just to have the larger rocks stay and then do away with the smaller rocks if you want less maintenance. I also had a downspout, I'm sorry, uh, a sump pump on the side of my house because I live at the edge of a hill, at the bottom of a hill. And so during the whole year, I would get the sump pump dumping water out to the street and it seemed like such a waste to me. So now the sump pump will go through the system into my rain garden and the tree that I planted right next to the rain garden has done remarkably well. Sometimes trees take a while to take off and grow from newly planted. This tree has never had a down cycle. It's continuing to grow since I put it in. And I think it's because the consistency of the water in the soil nearby has been um, really good. The, the moisture level has been very good. So anyways, that's a, it's a beautiful solution to adding some interest in your garden, adding some practical sustainable practices, um, some sustainable practices to your garden. And this is when the garden has completely filled up on the, the heaviest rain event of the year. It went all the way up to the top of my swale and it never went over the edge. Um, it was able to absorb all that water within an, um, 20 minutes maybe. Um, and it in the, in the same time, all of, well, the gopher, I'm sorry, not the gopher, uh, mole hill, all of the mole tunnels must have filtered out of the water because the poor mole probably got flooded. But um, it definitely helped to water all those plants during the, the winter very well. So just to imagine if you had lawn here and the lawn was not, um, um, and no organic matter had been added to the lawn for years, there's like a hard pan under that lawn and that's why you have to water it so often. And that water that had fallen on here or distributed to this area probably would have just sheeted right off the property into the street. Whereas in my yard, it all was captured and stayed in my yard. I'm, I'm off subject here. Excuse me, Kim, this is Claire. I just wanna give you a heads up. It's, uh, it's uh, we're halfway. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I am talking a lot today. Okay, so I need to uh, just go ahead and keep going. So um, just real quickly, this water slowly sinks into the soil, it filters pollutants, water is held in the soil um, available to the trees surrounding it, and uh, it helps reduce the, the flood control. All right, so examples of permeable pavement which is also another way of, of letting water sink into your soil. Um, this particular one I love, it stares down through a garden. Um, this is broken concrete. So talking about recyclable materials, broken concrete laid as flagstone. They used an iron oxide wash over the top. It's basically a, like a, 
um, rust type of material that they made the pavers look a little bit more like flagstone. And then I also love the look of landscaping um, in between a driveway and probably these are succulents. So another way to collect rainwater. So nurturing soil, um, adding compost is another, com is another um, uh, practice is nurturing soil. Adding compost helps feed soil organisms. In return, those soil organisms will work together to provide nutrients to the plant roots. Microbes will thrive when compost and oxygen and water are present in the soil. So this living soil will hold more water and filter pollutants. You wanna remember that, um, that if you have an area where you don't water, the soil microbes are not very active. In fact, they might even go dormant. So soil does need to have moisture in it. Um, whenever you can possible, you can add compost and mulch to help maintain that moisture. This is the food web, and this is all part of what I consider soil organisms. Um, the roots are fed by um, organic matter, and that is including bacteria, fungi, nematodes, and there's a food chain here of organic matter is eaten by these creatures which are eaten by these creatures which are eaten by these creatures and so all of those contribute to the food web so to uh, not allow those creatures in your soil or not to feed those creatures in your soil meaning you're disrupting the food web climate change to understand climate change is a really uh, complicated but also simple um, concept you basically have too much carbon in the atmosphere. Um, carbon is a building block of life. Everything is made from it. Everything alive is made from it. Carbon is a problem and a solution. And what we have with climate change is a balance problem. We burn carbon in fossil fuels and we use non-sustainable farming, basically massive farms that produce one product, which help, which releases carbon to the air and it depletes the um, non-sustainable farming, depletes uh, soil nutrients. The excess of carbon in our air is heating up the planet and disrupting our climate cycles. The ocean is also being disrupted with having absorbed extra carbon, which is warming the water and is creating acidification and mass extinction. So carbon farming is one potential um, way to solve the massive amounts of carbon being released. Um, we all we want to reduce the, the fossil fuels, of course, but in carbon farming, um, plants with sunlight and water will perform, the basics of carbon farming is, they perform photosynthesis by taking the carbon from the air and they produce carbohydrates or sugars. Plants produce carbohydrates from the carbon in the air. They pump those sugars down into their roots and they help to feed the microorganisms that I showed you before. And those microorganisms use the carbon to build and store carbon in the soil. When you add compost to the soil, it increases the carbon storage and you also increase the numbers of microorganisms. You're basically feeding them. So sustainable practices of low or no tilling, and this could be used in your own garden um, for veggie garden. The, there's more information on our website about low tilling. Um, planting trees, cover crops, and planned grazing will complete the practice of carbon farming. Additional benefits of healthy soil include that you're, there is more nutrient-rich food and better water holding capacity in your soil. The crops are more resistant to drought and the generation, regeneration of soil is one solution to, um, to carbon um, excess. Okay, I don't know if that um, was clear. I kind of went through it fast, but um, this is a chart that kind of shows the cycle, pulling carbon from the air, feeding the roots, feeding the microorganisms, and less carbon is released when it's held in the soil. This uh, program 
is also going to be available on the YouTube. So if anything that I went through, went, if I went through it too quickly, you can also review it again later on YouTube. Right plant for right place. This is a whole subject matter for a whole lecture on its own. And there's another master gardener who covers quite a bit of information on, um, on the right plant for the right place. Basically, I'd like people to start considering, instead of going to the nursery first, when they do a landscape design, go buy nursery plants first and then come home and not know where they are going, or you buy too many, or you buy the wrong size, consider first doing a, a small plan of attack, um, either on, on paper or you know, lay it out in your garden. But make sure you're buying plants that are adapted to your particular climate. What's good for the coast is not necessarily always good for Sonoma, um, the city of Sonoma. So you wanna know that the plant that you're purchasing actually will be happy in your region of Sonoma County. You wanna make sure you consider the size. Um, we, do, we don't wanna to have to heavily prune a plant to keep it within the parameters of your garden. So make sure when you look at the label, you're seeing what the maximum size of that plant is, and then you give it the space that it needs. You wanna make sure it's in the right light conditions and water conditions. So this again is Josh Williams' garden, the backyard. This is all native plant material. So California natives have a sense of place here in Sonoma County. They look like they belong here. Um, some people prefer tropical, some people prefer, um, you know, English style. Um, and in some small places in your garden, I can see that can be interesting. But consider adding native California natives when possible, because they um, attract pollinators and they look like they belong in the environment that we live. This is me too. I also have tried um, things and not been successful. So we are here to help whenever possible. There are websites you can go to, sonomawatersavingplants.com. Um, we will have this link in our um, chat section. Um, but you can go here and say, I have full sun, I want a five foot plant and I want colorful flowers. And you can put parameters like that in and it will give you some suggestions. Then these will be mostly water saving plants. These will not be higher water use plants. So also our website is extremely useful for plant, mis plant material selection as well. We spent over a year, a committee of um, several of us spent over a year selecting our favorite plants and we broke them down into categories of trees, shrubs, perennials, and also by size. And so we have a long list of lovely plants that we would consider very um, usable in gardens for Sonoma County. So check out our website for this list as well and the various breakdowns of plant material. Um, real gen um, generally, this is, um, another website. So if you ever want to know what your plant water use is, this is a website that specifically calls out whether a plant is high, medium, or low water use, or extremely low water use. And um, landscapers use this to qualify for permits for gardens that are new or uh, renovated. And uh, why this is important is because um, one of the key elements you want to consider when you design a garden or when you're uh, renovating a garden is you want to hydrozone plants that are similar in water use together. So for instance, moderate water use plants like roses need to go with other moderate water use plants. And that would be one valve or multiple valves on your um, controller so that you're not overwatering, you're not underwatering, and you're saving water. Low water plants would also go in their own area, and then a high water use plant would be something similar to a grass or a vegetable garden. So each one of these zones would have a separate valve on your controller. 
And this actually maximizes your water use and also your plant health. You certainly don't want to put low water plants with a high water plant. So you want whenever possible to um, zone your plants in your garden. The heat island effect. Um, so when you use AstroTurf in large amounts, small you know, amounts for a dog or, or you know, a small area, not a big deal. But when you use a really massive amount of gravel or a um, AstroTurf, you're creating a heat effect during the summer that is really not pleasant to sit in, to walk around. It just is, it's hot, it's dry, um, and it has absolutely no benefit for pollinators, soil microbes, or the watershed. Because if this was hit by a major rain event, more than likely the ground is hard. And so it would just sheet right back off into the street. You're not holding any of that water. So whenever possible, use this in the smaller amounts, not as the main feature of your garden. Invasive plants are something to be discussed briefly, but um, we are hopeful that these are not being sold at the local nurseries, but they include things like uh, Vinca Major, which you sometimes see near riverbeds in Sonoma County, ice plant you see on the coast, you also see the pampas grass that's along the coast and uh, the straight species of fountain grass and feather grass, which is used to be beloved by many landscape designers, but these are all quite invasive and in the wrong location, they can spread into the wild areas and take away habitat from native plants and desirable plants. So try not to um, ever use these in your garden or, and avoid, um, purchasing them. So another thing to remember when you're designing your garden is to use trees for cooling and heating. When you plant deciduous trees on the west and east side of your house, it helps cool in the summer. When you plant evergreen on the north and the, and the northwest side of your house, it helps block winter winds. Obviously in, the, in our new fire wildlife, fire wildfire world, we do not want to plant trees too close to houses. So the general rule of thumb is um, the branches of the tree should be no closer than 10 feet. So if your tree grows 20 feet, you want to put your um, center, you want to place that tree far enough away so when it's mature, those branches will not touch your house and you, will have to, you won't have to prune so much. So that would be 20 foot, you'd have to plant at least 20 feet away from your house. Um, so for smaller suburban areas, use smaller trees. Do not use huge trees. So that's um, one way to reduce your maintenance in the future. All right, so uh, growing food is very sustainable. And whenever possible, um, growing and buying local food is um, a really great way to remain sustainable. There's um, many ways to do that and we have in Master Gardeners what we call our food specialists and they will go out to community gardens and they will help community gardeners and food gardeners learn about growing food. So um, I, I think you should, uh, if you're interested in the subject, definitely check out our website and see if you can attend one of their talks. Irrigation and smart controllers. There's, this is a whole nother subject in itself. Again, I'm just gonna cover it briefly. Something you wanna consider is very few people have um, uh, shrub sprinklers anymore, but um, it, drip irrigation will help to avoid runoff in your garden because it slowly waters plants at the point of, um, of where you're growing it. Um, whenever you can um, and you have sprinklers for your, if you do have a lawn, and lawns, you know, in small quantities and small sizes, um, I can understand people still wanting those. So um, sprinklers um, for lawns should be set at uh, multiple short run times. And what that means is basically after so many minutes of watering your lawn, um, 
the water will start to run off into the street. And if you see any runoff into your street, that means you're watering too long. And so you'll have to cut that water time down and then water again in like an hour. And so allowing that water to penetrate the soil. So that's what I mean by sh a multiple short run time. So either multiple times during the day or multiple times during the week. Um, overspray, um, you never want to have the lawns uh, sprinklers overspray into hardscape. That's also wasteful. And um, shrub areas in general. So uh, standard um, automatic controllers. You may or may not know that it's not a one time per year set and you're done. You need to, ch um, to check any manual controllers, your, your controller for your valves, for your sprinklers or your irrigation. You wanna check that four times a year. So during the spring and the fall, you use at least 25% less water in your garden than you do during June and July and August maybe. In the winter time, ideally we have rain, not 100% not around here lately, but if we have rain during the winter, you should have that controller turned off. A weather-based system actually will talk to a weather station and will do the work for you. It will control how much water is being distributed to the garden throughout the year. They're usually used for larger gardens because they are a little bit more money, but um, um, a, a lesser version of that would be a, uh, a weather-based controller that has a rain gauge, and so it turns your system off when the cup is filled. So that is a very useful system as well. And the local water department is actually asking people to use more of these smart controllers to help save water. So a really great tool for people with irrigation, and you want to figure out how much irrigation to use for the, each time, each point of the year, is uh, something called Water Smart through the city of Santa Rosa. So it might be slightly different if you live in Sonoma or the coast, but this is based on what the conditions are in Santa Rosa. But it gives you every day what your, your controller could be set at for grass, so three, 30 minutes per week, and you wanna have that broken down to two to three times per, um, um, per week, and how many start times, so maybe one to two start times. So this is what we mean by multiple uh, start times. Um, it also gives you information on watering for drip and uh, for trees. Um, part of your irrigation and um, some people don't do is watering their trees on a separate valve and that actually really is useful. And I notice in my neighborhood, a lot of people don't even water their, their street trees. And during the really heavy, dry, hot summers, the trees suffer and it can eventually lead to disease and, and decline. So um, the trees should be watered on a separate valve. So this is my meadow. Um, I used a closed loop system that with an inline uh, drip line. I used the quarter inch. I probably should have used the half inch because the quarter inch clogs a little bit more frequently than the half inch line. But this system means that it's connected on both sides and it waters the entire area evenly uh, with moisture. And so on a grass situation or a ground cover situation, it's very useful to avoid the overhead sprinklers in this case, because um, when you overhead spray, you have mist and a lot of waste of water. So this is uh, one way to do it, is to do it a subsurface system like this. Um, and you can find more information about this possibly um, at um, Irrigation, uh, irrigation supply places uh, that we have listed on our website. Um, we have, uh, they have information about how to install something like this, or you can have a landscaper install a closed loop system to again, prevent water loss. All right, let me see, next one. I'm trying to go through this a little quicker because I'm talking a lot. All right, so, um, Drip irrigation for shrubs. I 
I, on my, in my garden, I did a snaking system where I watered on two sides of the, the plant, the shrubs, um, at the point of each location of the shrubs. On trees, it's a really great idea to use, okay, here, uh, a loop around a tree so that it's a um, loop that can expand with the root system of the tree. So you have multiple emitters or inline drip, which is um, regularly spaced emitters on a tube. And as the tree grows and matures, you widen that loop into a larger um, area and you're watering the roots that grow out further. If you only keep water at the base of a plant, um, then eventually, you know, the plant will not get what it needs. Um, also, you never want to water directly at the crown of a tree or the crown of a shrub because that can cause damage to the trunk. So always water a few inches out. All right, next slide. Storing rainwater is another solution. However, uh, there's only so much water you can store in a tank such as this. So if you want to have rainwater to water your veggie garden, a larger tank like this might do. This is a, a, a space saving version, this one that's vertical, or you can stack. Um, on a really large garden, you probably wouldn't have enough water holding capacity to make this work. But um, it is another solution. And if, uh, if you want to give it a try, it's, it's definitely fun to see how much you can collect and use. Let's see, um, gray water is another possibility for getting more water in your garden. This is a laundry system. The city of San Santa Rosa was giving a rebate for this and even the tools to make this happen. Um, you can occasionally check their um, water department to see if they're still um, providing the materials. I, maybe one of my helpers could find out if there's a link I forgot to mention this. Um, I'm not sure during COVID what they're doing for rebates. Um, but anyways, this is another option that you can look into with the city. Um, the, obviously, if you're using a chemical like a bleach, uh, you would shut the system down and it would go directly to the sewer. And then when you want it to flow to the garden, you would open it and it's an open system that distributes water into a, an area around each outlet. And for a fruit tree orchard, it would be extremely useful. Or for a shrub area, it would be really useful. So um, it's definitely a potentially a useful um, way to save water. Mulch is our mantra. It's here at Master Gardeners. We say mulch, mulch, mulch whenever we can. Uh, mulch is basically any material that you can use to cover the soil. But I would definitely recommend whenever possible using organic mulch. Increasing your soil's ability to retain moisture by adding two to three inches of organic mulch helps prevent soil um, degradation and carbon loss. Uh, organic mulch, you know, is composted wood bark, basically. It becomes food for living organisms as it breaks down and helps to improve soil texture over time. Decorative bark, like chips and shredded bark, lasts longer, but they're less available to plants for nutrients. So they might be good as a path or something like that if you want a longer um, lasting um, mulch. But um, you want to choose this option. You want to use a, a, we used to recommend four to six inches, but because of fire now, we're recommending a much smaller depth, a two inches a layer. You also want to avoid placing mulch within three inches of trunks or stems to avoid rot. Always give a little bit of airspace around your plants. Um, green mulch is another um, useful thing, the dense ground cover or um, if you have vegetables, a cover crop during the winter, is it always beneficial to the soil to keep it moist throughout the year? It adds nutrients when it breaks down and texture and helps support microbes. So for fire safety, our new mantra is that we use with, I can talk about fire safety a little bit more if I have time, um, but it, 
basically uh, fire safety, mulch, everyone's concerned about using mulch in the garden. We still recommend using mulch, but the new thought is not within five feet of your house. And nothing in, uh, you have to use an inorganic mulch, I should say, within five feet of your house. So none of the bark products next to your house. Um, a, gr a beautiful gravel, an interesting gravel, pavers um, are all what we're recommending directly next to your house. Um, because you want to work for fire safety, you want to work from your house out. So the first five feet matters quite a bit. And um, the heavy bark use next to your house just has a stream for where the, the fire can creep up to your house. Okay, so good bug versus bad bug. Um, this is part of IPN. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just basically say that, you know, not very many bugs that you find in your garden are really bad bugs. They all have part of, they're all part of the ecosystem. There are a few we can't tolerate, especially in vegetable gardens, but the bugs in this panel are extremely useful. We've got spiders, serpent fly, which is a pollinator, soldier beetle, which helps kill other nasty bugs, and some grubs turn into beetles. So beetles are another um, uh, uh, bug that helps eat the bad bugs. So unless you're in a vegetable garden, um, I would say most um, bugs should be left alone. In vegetable gardens, it's easier to um, dislike them because they eat your little seedlings. This over here is a ladybug, a lady beetle um, larvae. So even though it looks nasty, he's actually a good bug. All right. If something is not eating your plants, then your garden is not part of the ecosystem. So remember, a little bit of damage should be tolerated. And in my case, this is my uh, coffee berry, and it doesn't bother me to have small amounts shoot up. And in spring, the flowers are very tiny on a coffee berry, but it's, this plant is an amazing pollinator attractor. And I'll have 20 varieties of pollinators on my um, coffee berry in the spring. And it's amazing to look at the, all the varieties of creatures. Okay. Integrated pest management is a, a whole nother subject in itself. We have a, a group that specializes in this. Um, some of the practices include um, the use of pesticides whenever possible. Try to do uh, non-chemical pesticide, um, non-chemical uh, methods of removing pests, um, spraying with water, using safer soap. Because when you use a, a pesticide that kills bugs, uh, standard type, you'll kill the good and the bad bugs. So we want to keep those good bugs in. If you kill all bugs in your garden, you will have more problems than you started with. Um, good bugs eat bad bugs, and you have to learn to live with a certain amount of damage. Um, pruning shrubs to a natural shape helps with um, of course aesthetics, but also airflow, and it reduces the amount of disease and even pest problems you might have. When they're sheared into geometric shapes, it can also become um, a place where light doesn't uh, penetrate through the center and you can have a lot of dead material in the center. That is a really bad scenario for when fire um, blows ash in a fire situation and the ash blows in onto a really densely pruned shrub, which I'm gonna talk about again. Um, that could be a problem that would um, potentially ignite with an ash, um, with ash. I'm getting off subject again. Um, anyways, so um, pruning dead and diseased wood is always a good, any time of year, prune disease and dead wood. Um, but especially before spring, it can harbor disease. Pruning, um, uh, winter pruning increases growth in the spring. Summer pruning uh, decreases the biomass and slows growth. So if you ever want to reduce the size of a plant, don't cut off the major limbs, but reduce it down slowly during uh, late summer, early, um, I'm sorry, late spring, early summer. 
Um, and in the winter, if you want to encourage growth and you want to encourage branching, grow in late, I'm sorry, prune in late winter. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. All right, next slide. Protect and encourage wildlife whenever possible. You want to invite pollinators and beneficials into your garden, planting diverse native and flowering plants with multiple colors in clusters of three feet or more. So don't just add one flowering variety of plant to your garden, add multiples so that you at least cover three feet of your garden with that same plant. Then that bug flower, um, I'm sorry, butterfly bug has more um, food to, to draw from. You also wanna add host plants to support larvae Adding a water source with pebbles helps them drink and leave some areas that are bare in your soil, bare soil for native ground dwelling bees, which are, are um, just as important as the honeybees that uh, we have. Leaf litter and clump grasses help provide nesting sites for bumblebees and butterflies. And monarchs are the only ones who migrate, so the rest of these creatures need food sources throughout the winter. So it's nice to plant things that bloom throughout the year. And in our climate, we can do that. Things, there's a lot of things that will bloom throughout the year. So conserving energy is really important. We want to be careful of noise and air pollution. Two-stroke uh, blowers are the ones that you hear when the gardeners come and they go room, room, room. Those are called two strokes. And um, they're really noisy. They're very polluting. And it you know, not just disturbs your enjoyment of nature, but it does pollute the air. Um, consider whenever possible to change to electric equipment or even better hand tools. Um, I use an electric blower and it works just fine. And I only have to use it a few times a year. So I call this crimes against horticulture. Um, the problem with this is uh, a design problem and a maintenance problem. So first of all, the designer who put this in placed in plants that were too large for the space given. So the maintenance person shaved it down to the size they wanted it. So what happens when you do this is, like I said before, this shrub is now this intense mat of outer leaves. But if you were to look in the inside of it, it would be dead material on the inside. They have no way to get in there and clean out the dead material because they've made it so dense. So if a fire was to come along and blow embers onto this bush, it would probably ignite. And it is way too close to this house for this size and too close to each other. So all of this would start to catch to each other and then this hedge would ignite. So it's a fire danger. It's also not attractive. So whenever possible, try to select plants that are the size that you want them at maturity. And, and if it's very close to the house, space them out. Um, and there's more information about spacing plants on our website for fire safety. But also I see here that there's a lot of trees in here if these trees were to grow to full size, they would start to grow within 10 feet of that house. And again, another fire danger. So design is important, maintenance is important, and you have to consider both. Compost. Do I have time to ask a question to my moderator? Do you know how I'm doing on time? Bruce, are you there? I, it's, it's clear it's 1135. Um, 11.35. Okay, so I think I have time to ask um, a question. Um, how many people are currently composting? I'm Claire, how do we do this? We ask on the you, chat section. Um, go, people should go to their participant down to the bottom or on the screen where it says participants and click on that. And then on my screen, I'm on a, I'm on a Windows based computer you'll see a yes or a no button and you can click like a poll on there. So th there's a huge amount, as I've already discussed, several benefits of compost. Um, whenever possible, if you don't have to have compost brought into your garden each year, if you can create 
if you have a larger vegetable garden, if you have a larger garden in general, um, composting on site is very useful. It's you know obviously more economical, but but you're also producing from the material that is local to your garden. So bringing that material, that organic material, back into your soil is extremely helpful. Um, when you buy from other locations, there's possibility that it's yard waste from everybody in the county. You don't necessarily know what you're getting in that, although I, would, I wouldn't disclaim using that. I would, I would say it's still good material, but it's better to use what's from directly from your garden. Um, compost is still good no matter where it comes from, but better to use from your own area. Um, so you can do this with kitchen waste, you can do it with a larger system. Obviously, if you have a very small house, a smart, small garden, it's a little bit harder. I have a single bin in my little garden side yard, and I pretty much fill it up within a year, and it sits there. I'm a lazy gardener, so I don't turn it, but I still get, at the end of the year, I still get some compost to use in my vegetable garden. So um, I would encourage you whenever possible. How many people responded? So Kim, of the 59 participants, about half, 24, say yes, they compost. Well, good for you. Um, I, if you need more information about composting, we actually have a specialist who does talks for local schools, but there's also really great information on our website. Um, as you can see here, there's a whole section on composting. So if you want more information about composting, I would encourage you to go there. All right. We've got, some, we've got some organic gardeners in this group. I love it. All right, so whenever possible, um, reuse recycle materials. Um, I love the re reuse of, I showed a similar picture in the, in the um, permeable paving section of reusing concrete. This is another way to reuse concrete where you're taking like a sidewalk or a driveway and you're stacking it as a retaining wall. You could add some color to this, um, like a stain, a concrete stain, if you wanted to add more color, but it's a very attractive uh, way to recycle. I love this use. This is manhole covers used as a path, um, found at the salvage yard, which I love, the salvage yard. And a friend of mine gave me a bunch of blue bottles. And so this is my art installation in my garden where um, it added a little bit of pop of color, which I enjoy. Uh, so whenever possible, recycle. Um, Firewise gardening, this is another whole subject in itself. We have specialists that deal with firewise gardening. So the, the main takeaways is no home or plant is fireproof. There are no guarantees for fire safety, no matter what you do. Fireproofing, which is, you know, sounds bad, but you can still try um, your best at preparing your house for a potential fire by starting your fireproofing at your home and working your way out. So do all of the things like clean your gutters for, um, and your roof of any um, debris. You want to trim trees of, of 10 feet away from your house at minimum. You want to um, remove wood piles that might be stacked up against your house or close to your house. And this is the hard one for me. You want to remove any plants, especially ones that are heavily pruned, like I showed you before. You want to remove any plants that are larger than two feet from the base of your house. I haven't quite gotten to that point yet in my house, but I have done the pruning to make them um, so that they haven't got any dead material in them. Um, keeping them hydrated and um, properly pruned is a huge step. Maintenance is a huge step in this firewise uh, world. Um, so ideally, you don't want any plants that are taller than uh, two feet, especially near a window or an opening or any wood surfaces of your house. There's many other things you can do for firewise um, prepping. Um, and we have a whole website uh, devoted to it. But remember, start at your house and work your way out. That's the main thing. The other part that I didn't mention is, I did say it actually before, um, within five feet of your house, no bark or um, flammables of any kind. So um, 
when I do a demo garden at the fair, I demonstrate that um, rock can be a really decorative element and mulch around your house. And you can add something that's low growing, like a non, um, um, fire intensity is a big deal about plants you choose. So a grass has less fire intensity when it burns. So it's less likely to catch other things nearby. Um, succulents have a lot of water in them. They're not guaranteed not to burn, but they have um, less um, potential for catching other things nearby. So stay short and small and well watered. And um, those are the main things I want you to take away from this. But again, there's a lot more to learn, um, whole subject in itself. The next slide shows you um, some examples. I would say that some of these don't necessarily follow completely all of the concept I just mentioned. I see a tree that's very close to the edge of the house. But in general, this is a really great starting point. If you have a house that was burned and you're building a new garden, um, these are our templates that were created specifically for you. Um, they include, um, these, these are uh, designs that have complete landscape plant selection and irrigation plants. And you can download these for free off the web and it gives you options of a cottage garden and a modern garden, contemporary garden, and a native garden. And these are really beautiful. And they also demonstrate to you how you can um, put plants together in, an, in a really unique, beautiful way. Um, you still wanna follow some of the rules we mentioned um, when it comes to placement. But I would encourage anyone looking for design ideas to go check this website out. Okay, Garden Sense, we are kind of in limbo a little bit right now. Garden Sense is a program if with master gardeners that um, have two master gardeners come out to your home and speak with you about your um, ways that you can use uh, plants, low water plants in your garden and save um, water through um, drip irrigation. And so we're all about water saving and we're giving you direct answers to your questions and giving you at times um, people will actually want the start of a design. So we'll do a simple design for some of the suggestions we have. Um, I'm not sure exactly, does anyone in our group know? It, um, I haven't caught up with it, um, what they're yes. currently doing. Yes, Kim, um, some people uh, are actually doing social distance visits. Um, some people are doing a virtual visits, but Garden Sense is a very active program. Okay, so you can go to our website and request um, a video um, meeting to discuss your specific landscape uh, on and ways to save water. Originally, we started with the hope that we would reduce the use of lawns in Sonoma County, but now there's a lot more that we can offer as well. You know, the irrigation information and the plant selection information. So um, check it out if you have any questions about um, your specific garden and you want some help getting started in renovating or develop developing a brand new garden. Um, so last slide is a review of the main topics I was hoping to relay, which is basically whenever possible, remove or reduce any unused lawns. They are basically water hogs. Um, use water efficiently whenever possible, and that would be through drip irrigation and mulch. Uh, spread uh, slow and sink rainwater on site. Feed living soil. Feed those organisms in your soil with com uh, organic compost. Avoid tilling your soil and cover it with mulch again to maintain the moisture level in your soil. Compost your green waste hopefully locally in your own yard, but if not, um, still compost that green waste. Right plant, right place, whenever possible, grow your own food. It's actually quite fun and again, something to check out. Um, provide um, beneficial insects with food and shelter. 
reuse recycled materials, reduce energy use, and learn about fire-wise landscaping. So the last slide, again, is all of the different websites that I had mentioned throughout the program. I believe they are on the chat section that you can copy. Is that true, Claire? Um, they, Laura's been pu uh, pu um, putting links in the chat room. And um, I think Bruce, Bruce, can you pipe up? I think Bruce was going to tell people how to actually save a copy of that, unless you want me to do it. Um, I think that uh, you should, for Bruce. Sorry, uh, Bruce. Uh, no problem. I think that uh, you should uh, do it. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. inexperienced in that regard. You could well, also, you could also use your phone and just take a picture of this page too. You, you can, but if you go to, if you go to the chat bubble, uh, bubble or whatever you call it, you will see toward the bottom, three little dots. If you hover over that, it'll say more. So click on that and it says save chat. Hmm. And you can actually save it to your own computer. How am I doing on time? I'm good on time, right? Uh, it's 11.47. Okay, so we're going to do some question and answers. Does anybody have questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think that um, what we'll do is, uh, per our ground rules, I will be uh, moving over to the chat to see that, um, uh, to see if there are any questions in the chat room. And then I'll just throw it open to see if there are any additional questions that didn't make it to the chat. So I'm proceeding to uh, the chat room on my iPad here. And Bruce, and, you have been and, answering questions um, as they came up. The only one that we haven't asked answered is a question from Nancy. Um, Kim, how long did it take you from start to finish to redo your garden? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I had composted, I did the sheet mulching during the fall, and um, I have a very handy husband, so we did it ourselves. Even though I'm a landscape designer, uh, we're kind of like do-it-yourselfers, so Andy, um, my, well, I shouldn't say, but and, uh, my husband and I did um, the garden ourselves, so we started by doing the sheet mulching in the fall, just because I had so many weeds and everything going on and we were also busy. We waited till spring. We uh, did the dry stream and the planting um, probably within, you know, weekends, a couple months. Um, my husband's quick, like very handy, like I said. So he he cut the flagstone. He he made the dry stream. So if you don't have that access to someone to help you, um, there are landscapers that can do this kind of thing as well. Can you talk to them about the quill? Lance? Yeah, there, there is a, a, I think there's a reference on our uh, uh, Garden Sense page, maybe even in the, in the comments, you could play, maybe post it if you get a chance. But there's a, a group of trained, so uh, there's a water department trains local landscapers in water, um, conservation and sustainability, and they call it the Quell program. And if you look for a landscaper that is Quell qualified, they have more information about doing landscapes with sustainability in mind and low water use in mind. So that's something to consider when you choose someone. And Kim, this is Claire. Can you tell people what Quell stands for? I think qualified I know. But... Water efficient <laughs> landscaper. Thanks. I think. <laughs> I think that's right too. If I remember, my brain is picking at my brain here. Um, okay, anything else? Was that, was that good enough? Um, is it my understanding, and I wanted to make sure that we're not missing anyone, um, that all of the questions, uh, all of the issues or questions that were placed into the chat room, those have already been dealt with. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, very good. And so, Kim, I think that uh, unless there are any other questions that... Uh, uh, Bruce, I think there was one question uh, about somebody who's asking about ballpark figures of what it would cost somebody to do a front yard of a house your size. Is it okay, about 30,000, 40,000, 10,000? <laughs> I think that's what, that, that's what people are looking for, a sense. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm not a great example of that because we are do-it-yourselfers. And I also am a landscape designer, so 
I designed my own garden. My husband was my labor and, um, and I can buy wholesale plants. But given that, um, we reused a lot of things on site. I already had the rock for my dry stream. We had some of the flagstone already and I purchased plants and mulch and irrigation. And we spent around $2,000, but that's with free labor <laughs> and free design. So I, I don't actually have a great number for you if someone else were to come in and do it. And it really kind of depends on the extent of what you do. So we had about a thousand square feet, feet of lawn and we added plant material and irrigation to that area. I really recommend anybody um, doing a design. Um, if you have a flat lawn and you're trying to plant it, consider adding mounding and, and um, swales and mounds, you know, put that um, rain garden in, put the mounds. So soil import, you know, importing some really good quality soil or some compost is worth the money to spend. Do the groundwork um, and the sheet mulching because uh, later on the maintenance will be so much better if you start with good soil. Um, I would definitely invest in that. And soil, relatively inexpensive. It doesn't feel like it's worth the money at first, but it really is. Yeah, Kim, this is Claire. I have another suggestion for maintain for trying to lower the, the cost of some of these things, which is you could make it. You could make a decision to buy smaller size plants. Yes you know, a one gallon instead of a five or a 15. And exactly. the, yeah, the, the, the differential in cost could be tremendous if you're so a little there, patient. There are, yes, one gallon plants um, are actually a really great way to start. It may seem small at first, but if you're talking about some, uh, shrubs and perennials, um, it, they will grow within two years and you'll see some results that you enjoy. There are places to buy plants that are less expensive. There's local sales and um, there's the Jail Industries Plants um, Nursery that's over by the airport. Um, you can call them uh, for an appointment. I believe that they're, they're open for a little while longer. Um, they, um, that and then there's the local schools that sell plants. But um, do your research first before you buy the plants. Make sure you know what you want and what size they're going to become so you have at least a plan before you go. Oh, I see um, um, uh, one more question that's just uh, popped up. Um, it says, uh, I have a, well, it's a comment. I have a small backyard, remove grass, including included permeable hardscape, brought, um, brought in improved soil, compost, mulch, small stone walls, and picked out some patented tree varieties that increase plant costs. Use professional labor was greatest part of cost, but overall $11,000. Yeah, it really just depends on the, what you install and who you're using to install it. Um, yeah, so my 2000 is not typical. Um, but that, you know, if you are a do it yourselfer, you can do the smaller plants, invest in soil, and keep it simple. Okay, this is Bruce again. Um, there's another good question that just popped up. Is there a good computer program that helps with planning? I haven't, I don't have anything to recommend, but if you want ideas, there were those landscape templates that were for the fire rebuild, which are on my information um, list. And they have really, I think they're really inspiring in terms of getting ideas. And you can also check out your neighbors, what your neighbors are growing and ask them questions. Of, if you don't know the plant names, you can ask them if they don't know the plant names, you can take a photograph of it and most nurseries will be able to help you identify. So um, check out the design templates as a starting point, map out something simple on a piece of paper, and then um, the irrigation section of it, if you have any confusion about that, you can ask for a garden sense visit. You can also ask for help at some of the professional landscape 
stores, sometimes they will help you with um, basics on irrigation as well. Um, one other comment that I, uh, I saw or see, um, one person, I guess this is with regard to the cost that uh, dwarf fruit trees uh, would be beneficial also. Um, how do you, what do you think about that, Kim? Anything where you can grow your own fruit or own food near, near your home, um, they are higher water use but you also provide a benefit. So it's a, it's a, it's a give and take on that. You know, I, ideally the, um, we wanna plant low water plants, but when it comes to food products, they definitely use more water. So you have to be more thrifty about how many of them you put in, do you drip irrigate them, make sure you mulch them, use really good soil. So you're holding water um, in the soil and you're not overusing your water. You know, even plants in pots are useful. They do use more water, but again, if you use strip irrigation, it, it reduces the amount of water. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and of course, uh, and, and one per, uh, um, connecting with that, uh, one person is indicating get bare root plants when possible. They are much less expensive and that's very true, isn't it? True. Yeah. And yeah. think about when you're planting trees and specifically trees, but you could consider this for uh, shrubs as well. If you have, if for instance, your base is this old lawn and you sheet mulch it, um, it's usually pretty flat. So when you're adding trees, consider raising the crown of the tree up a little bit above the um, the other portions of the garden. So mounting it is always a really good way to start for a larger plant because when you place it down low, um, it could be an issue with drainage. It could be an issue with good soil. So mounding, um, adding mounding in your garden actually is a really great way to start from um, kind of a low quality soil situation or or if you have a drainage situation mounting is really great mm -hmm. and one person uh with regard to the cost issue also one person indicated that doing it in stages is a good idea too i mean Absolutely. maybe you can do do the front yard first and then do the backyard at a, a later time so consider um if you want to start slow improve your soil first and foremost sheet mulch get rid of any weeds and with sheet mulch and, and good soil, the um, organic uh, mulch that breaks down, the I call it arbor mulch. There, there's maybe different names for it, but it's basically composted mulch. Start with that first, you know, any mounding that you want to do. Um, so have some kind of a plan and start with your trees first. So the largest items first, um, and then maybe temporarily you grow some um, seeded plants like wildflowers or something like that and then add more shrubs as you go and maybe add um, paving is expensive so add that later so you can do it in phases yes thank you so much kim uh, if there are no other questions i think we'll uh move to uh finishing up today um i wanted to mention um as the moderator that uh um and i apologize for my <laughs> my chiming clock going off there. But, um, <laughs> um, but I wanted to mention that the, due to, uh, the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel, the UC Master Gardener uh, channel for Ma or Master Gardens of Sonoma County. And um, there will be a link uh, to the recording um, located on the Master Gardener website that uh, we have been mentioning uh, throughout the uh, presentation. Um, the next workshop will be on October 10. And um, I have the title of that for you. Um, it's the first irrigation, first irrigation steps for a water wise garden. That will be on Saturday, October 10th, 2020, starting at uh, uh, t um, 10 o'clock. And uh, you need to register for that. And uh, there is a list of upcoming events um, on the Master Gardener page on the right hand side of the page. So uh, please check that out. And there's quite a few things, uh, interesting uh, topics and things coming up. And uh, another one is Ask uh, a Master Gardener, uh, which will be happening via Zoom, Zoom. And that will be starting on October 1st, next uh, Thursday. And you have to register for that also. And that is also listed on the right-hand 
side of the home page of the of the master gardener page um, and I think that the, we have covered just about everything and Kim I want to thank you so much for that w incredibly wonderful presentation it was well done um, and we really appreciate um, having you to present the talk uh, to us so um, without further ado I think that uh, we're finished with the presentation for today thank you Thanks to everyone for coming.